Is that? Well, me? not yet, Sally. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. I'd like to start with an introduction. My name is Neil Ramis. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Education here at Sonoma Land Trust. This presentation is scheduled for about an hour, which will be followed by a 30 minute section of question and answer. You can submit your questions via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. At the bottom of Zoom, there'll be an option that says Q&A. If you click on that, you'll be able to type your question in directly um, and it'll be submitted. We will only be answering questions that are submitted through the Q&A feature at the bottom. We will not be asking questions um, through the chat. The chat gets lost and I'm unable to, to track all of those. So please submit your questions. You can submit your questions anytime during the presentation or during the Q&A at the end. Tonight, I am solo managing the technology um, and hosting. So apologies in advance for any awkward pauses while I try to get all the tech set up and uh, try to get Zoom to cooperate with us. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Sonoma Land Trust is a local nonprofit that protects land in Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. We've been doing this work since 1976, and we've protected over 56,000 acres of our county so far. We accomplish our work through the generosity of our members and contributors. So thanks to all of you out there for helping us protect the beautiful Sonoma County for future generations. As a land-based organization, it is impossible to separate our work from those who stewarded these lands long before colonization. As we pursue our mission of conserving land in Sonoma County, we recognize at Sonoma Land Trust that we stand upon the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples and communities. We wish to honor their care and knowledge and stewardship of this special place across the ages and want to acknowledge the deep and lasting damage that colonization has inflicted upon them. We embrace our responsibility to learn and to protect their cultural traditional connections to the land. Next, I would like to introduce our speaker for the night for our talk titled The Chileno Valley New Brigade. Sally, Mia. Let me spotlight for everyone. And thank you, Maria. I, I see your hand. Uh, Sally Gale is a rancher who lives in Chileno Valley. She is the chair of the Marin Resource Conservation District Board. She's the former uh, board member of the Marin Conservation League and is the co-founder of the Chileno Valley Newt Brigade, along with her good friend, Gail Seymour. Sally's uh, present interest is in protecting and enhancing biodiversity, most especially newts, frogs, songbirds, beavers, bees, and butterflies. With that, I'd like you to all join me in welcoming Sally. Sally, take it away. Okay, well, I will try to. Um, there. Perfect. I think I'm ready to go, right? Yep, you're all good. All right, good evening, everyone. And thank you for tuning in to hear about the Chileno Valley Newt Brigade. We are a small, modest organization, uh, non-funded and uh, fully run by volunteers. And you might be interested in hearing about the Newt Brigade because like us, you might have noticed things in your environment that bother you and that you feel need changing. And you might get some ideas from my description of the way that we started and are organized so that you can make the changes that, that you see need to be made. So thank you for um, tuning in. And I will try to make this as informational and as interesting and as entertaining as possible. Um, my presentation will start with a little KQED uh, film on newts. Most of my slides um, are, are still pictures. And I think um, with newts, it's very important to see how they move so that you understand a lot more about them. So I'm gonna show you this little film. Life is struggle, sex, death. 
It's true across nature. It's especially true. Most of the time, California newts live quiet, hidden lives in the forest. But every winter, a newt can live for 20 years. They experience an uncontrollable urge. Called water drive. They leave the safety of their burrows to go mate. They begin a treacherous odyssey. Migration, back to the pond in which they were born. It begins with a hormone called prolactin, the same one that helps women produce breast milk. In newts, prolactin sparks a need to become aquatic. Water could be miles away, like three miles. That's the equivalent of 36 miles for you and me. Scientists don't know for sure, but something newts use their sense of smell to help guide them. And they only have one real defense against the snakes hiding in the brush, their skin. It's covered in a poison strong enough to kill a person. You ate one. Newt's yellow eyes and belly tell predators to stay away, but poison isn't always enough to protect them. Many never make it. As they move toward water, Newt's skin starts to lose its bumps and become smooth. Their long tails flatten into fins. Their amphibian bodies transform from terrestrial to aquatic to prepare for a mating frenzy. The male newt bolts up, it grows thick pads on its feet, perfect for clamping onto a female. The word is amplexus, Latin for embrace, which is one word for it. Newts can stay like this for hours, for days. The result? egg clusters that females lay in the pond. So many eggs that newts sometimes eat a few for extra protein. The ones that survive will grow into larvae and stay in the water for several months, transforming into adults. In the fall, they'll leave the pond. And then if they're lucky, they'll come back here again and again and again or at least they'll try. Okay. Um, I think that little film kind of sets the stage for understanding this, who are both a terrestrial creature and an aquatic creature. So they, they need two good, healthy habitats to survive. They need to live in the forest and they need to live Part of their lives and breed in a lake. In our neighborhood, that lake or that water body is Laguna Lake, which is a natural feature of um, this area. It is, it is not a dam. So I want to tell you a little story to kind of kick this off about how we started the New Brigade. The New Brigade was started four years ago and it began with an incident in which my husband and I were driving back from having dinner with friends during um, a rainstorm. The rainstorm was warm um, and uh, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, you know, a windy, horrible night. It was really quite pleasant, sort of a Hawaii kind of um, environment. But when we got to the lake and Chilena Valley Road runs right along the edge of the lake. We noticed that there was there were a lot of branches in the road. And then I noticed that many of the branches were the same size and the same shape. And then I noticed that they weren't branches at all, they were newts. And so I said, stop the car. And Mike stopped and I got out and I walked that mile of road in my good shoes. And I picked up every newt that I came across. So I picked up 45 dead newts and five live newts. And by the time I got to the other end of that mile stretch of road, 
I was determined to do something about the news and to keep them from getting run over by cars. It just did not seem to be the right thing for me. I want to emphasize that this, this was not an intellectual decision uh, or a well thought out decision. It was more of an emotional reaction to an experience that I had. Okay. We started uh, the new brigade. When I say we, I mean Gail Seymour and myself. She's here in the front row in the um, green t shirt. Gail and I started the new brigade by, well, me calling her up and telling her what I had experienced and how I felt. And then the two of us reaching out to everybody that we knew that might have an idea about what we could do for the newts. They were either scientists or funders or friends who, or organizers. They were people that, that we knew personally and, and had good relationships with. So there was a computer scientist, um, a, a herpetologist, a director of um, the Coastal Conservancy, um, Point Blue, um, volunteers from uh, my Apple group, and uh, the Audubon Society, Fish and Game, Spawn, et cetera. We had a meeting and we just kind of picked their brains and asked them what they thought. Uh, one of the up upshots of that was that the person who took this picture worked for the Point Race Light and he wrote, a pic he wrote a story about us. So we were able to reach out at that point and see if we could maybe talk some people into volunteering to be new brigadiers. This was the first gathering that we had I had to um, cook them a really nice dinner and make them a really nice dessert to get them to show up. And I also had a really good speaker, David Perlocker, who was uh, very entertaining and informative. So this, this is kind of our sneaky way of getting people to come and, and talk about joining the new brigade. We were successful and we got a few people to join in our efforts. And this is the first group that went out. You can see Richard Plant in the yellow slicker and Gail Seymour in the um, yellow slicker pants and several other people, Katie Clune in the middle. This was the first group. And as you can see, they were very enthusiastic. This is our I think this is our group yeah, last year. So over the period of a couple of years, our group grew, but uh, the, the enthusiasm level was about the same. You can see a lot of happy faces here. This was a training day in the fall of 2021. I want to switch now and kind of place you on the map and I've been talking about Laguna Lake, this natural lake. You can see it on the left of your screen and you can see how far it is from Petaluma um, to get out to, to our house. It takes about um, 15 minutes. So it's about a 15 minute drive from Petaluma to, to Laguna Lake. Where the road gets closest to Laguna Lake on, on the bottom of the lake is where the newts Across the road. If you look the other way, um, we are not very far from Tomales Bay. We're about six miles from Tomales Bay as the, as the crow flies. And uh, you can see that Laguna Lake is partly in Sonoma County and partly in Marin County. This is a closer view. Um, Laguna Lake is a privately owned lake and all the land around it is privately owned. So the only thing that's public is the road itself. The culture of the area is uh, ranching. Uh, family, the families in this picture have all been here. Well, you can only see two, two families, but they both of them have been here for a long time. 
many generations. So there's, it's a, um, I would say a proud uh, conservative agricultural community. Uh, this community goes back a long ways. This is the era of the Spanish occupation. And you can see even at that time, um, the county went through the lake, although it's, it, it isn't, it, it's not going through in the right place. But, and I think it's upside down. But anyway, I thought it was kind of a neat map. In 1873, you see two lakes. Uh, this, of course, was the case then as well. Um, but in this case, uh, at the present day, if you drove by, you would if you drove by in the winter, you would see two lakes. If you drove by in the summer, you would only see one lake because the smaller lake to the right of your screen is drained and planted or uh, in an agricultural crop. The Laguna, the large Laguna is also, was also drained and planted up until 1991. And since then it has not been drained uh, except for two years ago during the drought and it was planted then too. So since 1991, the lake has pretty much been left alone, although a lot of water is removed from it for agricultural purposes. This gives you a better idea of, of the upland habitat and the aquatic habitat. There's also an area in between that is marshy, that the sort of brown uh, looks like dead reeds uh, along the lake. And that area is, is kind of uh, important to the newts too. When the baby newts need to get out of the water and need to, to breathe air, um, they need uh, a protected area to hide and uh, an area that's moist. And they need to wait in that area until the weather is just right for them to start going up the hill. So when it, when it hits um, a certain temperature and a certain moisture level, those little newts will take off from the marsh and head toward the road, go across the road and then go up into the forest and find some place to uh, live, a gopher hole or under a log. And they'll grow until they're about five years old and then they'll come back down the hill. They, they can go from three to five miles up that hill. They'll come back down the hill, cross the road and go back into the pond and, and breed. These are some of our neighbors part of the culture of the area. They're very interested in what we do. Uh, the lake is, is beautiful. Here it is on a calm day in the evening. And another evening, every night is different. Every night is beautiful. Sunsets are always beautiful when they are reflected in the, um, the lake. So Laguna Lake is a very special place. It's home to many amphibians, many uh, waterfowl, uh, migratory waterfowl, mammals, uh, as well as domestic animals. And um, it also supports the agricultural community as well. When we first started working on the road, um, several of us took training in, in how to stop traffic and direct, redirect traffic and all of these kinds of things. And it turned out that we were not able to slow the traffic or redirect it or stop it or anything. So we just did our best the first year. The second year, the county was kind enough to put up these signs. And they also put up the signs the third year because the second year, the two signs were stolen. And then unfortunately, the third year, the two signs were stolen. So this year is the fourth year and we have created our own signs, which we secure 
with a heavy chain to a telephone pole on either end of, of the road uh, with a lock and key. So we put them up and take them down every night. This is the guy that we're talking about. This is a California newt. You can see he's got buggy eyes and kind of yellow uh, eyebrows and orange and an orange underbelly. He's standing up on his front feet right now and he's showing you how dangerous he is because his yellow color is telling you and everybody else that he is toxic. So don't eat him, don't hurt him. Unfortunately, when he does this to the cars, they don't pay any attention and they run right over him. A rainy, uh, warm night is kind of the best thing for newts and it brings a lot of them out. Here you can see three of the newts on the road. These are the kinds of nights that uh, we have to be out there in greater numbers than normal. I put this slide in here to just show you what this little newt is up against. He's a little tiny guy. He's got across this road and it's a big dangerous world for this little newt. Here are a couple of pictures of our volunteers. You can see that they all have reflective vests. They're carrying buckets so that if they run into a large number of newts, they can just throw the newts into the buckets and then photograph them later. You can see some of these pictures show people photographing newts. So this is one way that we collect information on each of the newts that we come across, whether it's a live newt or a dead newt, we photograph it and we collect various bits of information on it. Uh, some of the volunteers are wearing gloves because they are concerned about the toxins on the skin of the newts and other volunteers are not. I'm one of those volunteers who, who don't wear gloves and nothing has happened to me in five years. So we find other critters on the road and these are some of the critters and these are the numbers that we found this year. Uh, the most notable number here is the California red-legged frog, which is a listed species. This year, we have found 43 of them on the road. Some of these uh, critters are um, need the lake to breed, and, and many of them don't. So the I think it's the arboreal salamander and the slender salamander. Neither of those need to go to the lake to breed. And of course, the garter snake doesn't. Um, this is a series of pictures of the um, various amphibians and, and a reptile that we find on Chilena Valley Road. This is a red-legged frog. The adults get quite large. They're, they get as large as my fist. They're very beautiful, very interesting. And this year, uh, the majority of the red-legged frogs that we have found are, are small. As you know, it, it, it is listed. I did mention that before. Okay, there are lots of little tree frogs. They are the frogs that you hear singing out in the marshes and down by the creeks. They're very tiny and they have a very loud voice and they change colors. And a lot of times we don't photograph them because there are so many of them. This is an unusual looking fellow. Uh, it's an Incetina. And I am not sure about the Incetina. It may not have to go into the lake or not, but I, I really don't remember. Um, this slender salamander is very unusual looking. You can see the penny for size. They're also very small. They look like worms. And then when you get closer to them, you see these four little legs sticking out and a little head that looks just like the head of a newt. So they're pretty interesting. This is an arboreal salamander who does not need to go into the lake to breathe. If you pick him up, he wiggles all over the place. He's quite different from a newt 
which is a pretty calm little creature. Um, this bumpy toad is called a Western, California Western toad. And you can see that his coloration uh, enables him to blend in very neatly into the road. This is a Western pond turtle. It's also either listed or threatened. I can't, I can't remember which, but anyway, it is um, an animal that is not doing especially well. This particular fellow was found on the road by a biker and the biker brought the, the turtle over to me. And so what you see is my lawn and the turtle walking across the lawn. You might notice that he has a smooth shell. He's quite large. And we have a volunteer who owns uh, turtles. And he thought that because the shell was so smooth, that this turtle was probably, and because of his size, that he was probably around 50 years old. We took him back to the road where we found him and he turned around and went right up the bank and snuggled in, in under um, some brush and leaves. And he probably is still there. Eventually he will come out of that bank, road bank and go back down on the road and go over to the pond. So I just hope nobody runs over him. Um, this is a series on the information that the brigadiers collect. This person here is photographing baby newts. The baby newts are really small. They're an inch to two inches. They're hard to see, especially at night, especially on this road. And then if you're in a car, you can imagine that they're really hard to see. You can see an adult newt from a car. If, if you figured out what they look like and looked out for them, you can avoid adult newts. But the baby newts, I don't think anybody can really avoid them because they really, really are small. Anyway, um, this person is using her iPhone to record these little newts for iNaturalist. We also um, keep, make note of how many live and how many dead newts we see, and we photograph them so that we, we have a backup. We have a spreadsheet that we keep ourselves, and then we send information into iNaturalist. So we're part of a citizen science project. And we do our best, we make mistakes, but we do the best we can. So as of February 10th, um, this is what our last four years looked like. There are a couple of things you can take away from this. Right away, you can see that as time goes on, we, we are able to save more and more newts and, and find more and more dead newts. Um, you can also see that our percentage of saves is better. Uh, when we started out, it was about 50-50, and now it's about 80-20. So we feel that we're improving. Um, I think this is a reflection of the number of volunteers that we have out on the road, rather than the, the total number of newts. Uh, our situation is that some nights we are only out there for two hours, and of course the newts cross the road more than two hours a night. If, if, if it's a really busy night or a big night, what we call a big night, we might be out there for six hours, but we're never out there for 24 hours. So these numbers are, are not telling you the number of the population. They're just an indication of what we saw. This is a kind of a neat graph. It starts on 11-6-22. And the orange bars are juvenile newts and the blue bars are adult newts. So you can see that the juvenile newts come out of the lake and head for the hillside before the adult male newts come out of the hills and head for the water. The temperature 
and the weather is different for both. The baby newts seem to be able to tolerate cooler temperatures and they come out when it's just barely raining. It's just starting to mist. The adult newts seem to need more rain and warmer temperatures to get started. But anyway, you can see that there are shifts. So first we see the baby newts, then the adult males come down from the hill and go into the water and wait for the females and the adult females come down across the road and go into the water. So you can tell by turning them over which are males and which are females. The females, you can even see the eggs um, through their tummies. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, we're almost at 50-50. I think we're gonna get to 50-50 with adults and juveniles. But uh, the main thing I want to say about this image is that this year is unusual. We have seen a lot more juveniles this year than ever before. Um, this is all this year and uh, the, the takeaway from this slide is that uh, both the juveniles and the adults have about the same percentage of uh, rescued and um, uh, killed animals. So there, there doesn't seem to be hardly any difference between the two, which is actually a good thing because I was thinking because the juveniles are so tiny that maybe more of them were getting killed, but that is not the case. Um, I put this slide up here, not so much for the numbers because they don't match the other numbers. They were taken at a different time. But I wanted to um, note uh, not only, um, again, that we have found quite a few red-legged frogs this year, but also that uh, the majority of the newts that we find are California newts. So we find about 90% California newts and 10% rough skin newts. If you go north of here, you see more rough skin newts. So we're kind of in a transitional place. The other interesting thing about them is that they interbreed. So sometimes uh, it's hard to tell them apart. I have a series of months here and the takeaway on these, the, the series of months is that there's a great variety from day to day on how many newts we see in the road and, and other creatures. And it depends entirely on the rainfall and the temperature. So we started our season in 2021 uh, in November on the 1st with 139 live newts. And that was the best we did all, all month. And some days we didn't get any, as you can see. Uh, December, another odd month, uh, the 12th was a big day for the newts. We got 753 live newts. That was, that was crazy. Um, you can see there weren't many gotten on the 24th and 25th, although um, we may have had people out there. Uh, we probably didn't have too many people volunteering on Christmas. In January, again, we had a lot at the beginning, 835 live newts. And then for five days, we, we did very well. And then it kind of tapered off. My feeling here is that the large numbers reflect the newts coming down from the hill. And then the low numbers reflect the time, maybe when, the, when it was cold, probably it was cold and probably the newts were in the water uh, during their breeding time. And here's February. I think these numbers reflect the newts that are on their way back up the hill. So another period of large numbers. Okay, um, the information that we collect on each newt includes the latitude and longitude of where we took the picture of the newt or where the newt was. This gives us an idea of 
where the newts cross the most and the least. However, it also tells us that the newts cross everywhere. So if you wanted, I mean, you can just think, if you wanted to make sure that these newts made it across the road and you wanted to raise the road or put culverts in or something, to, re to be really effective, you would have to do it over a mile's length. And that would be very expensive. If you didn't have that much money or if you didn't have the political will to take care of the whole road, you can see that there's one section of the road where the curb is, where we found the greatest number of newts crossing the road. Interestingly, this spot is right across from the marsh, which I referred to earlier as the uh, jumping off place for them or the holding, where, where the baby newts are in a holding pattern until the weather changes. So, if you only had enough money to put culverts or underpasses or overpasses in a section of the road, you might concentrate on this curvy area. These are three different years and they're pretty much the same. Now this year, and I don't have one for this year yet, if this year's not over, but this year they're more evenly spread out. And in fact, there's a bump on the Western end, which reflects the baby newts. So the large number of baby newts has, has kind of changed this whole pattern uh, this fourth year. And we'll have to wait until the end of the year before we can really compare it to these three previous years. This is um, a map that was made by Cheryl Bream, who is an expert on amphibian crossings. And again, it highlights that curve uh, where most of the newts uh, were photographed. This is just a list of the information that we collect. So we want to know what kind of newt it is, how old it is, which way it's going, whether it's alive or dead. And then we want to know about you know, the temperature of the air, uh, we want to know the time that we saw the newt. We want to know the number of cars that were going by at that time. We want to know about the rainfall. And we want to know exactly where that newt was. This person is standing with her back towards the hill so that when she looks at her image after she gets home and is ready to load her information up onto iNaturalist, she will see that the head of the newt is at the bottom of her frame, which tells her that the newt is heading for the hills. So that's an important bit of information that we collect. Um, the other thing that she is going to be interested in saying about this newt that depends on the photograph is what kind of newt this is. And this particular newt is clearly a California newt. These pictures were selected because they're very contrasty and very different from one another. Um, on the left, you can see the California newts. On the right, you can see the rough skin newts. And they're very different, right? The California newt has a lot of orange underneath its eye. And the rough skin newt has a very distinct line that separates the orange from the dark uh, upper color on the upper part of its body. The rough skin newt is clearly, has a rougher skin than the California newt, although in this picture it's pretty bumpy. Um, the California newts have really buggy eyes and the rough skin newts do not. And then if they are threatened, the California newt uh, assumes the posture on the left and the rough skin newt assumes the posture on the right. Of course, you would never threaten them or, or worry them or upset them uh, just to decide whether they were a California newt or a rough skin newt. But anyway, that's what the pictures show. Um, I 
I, I want to say that these animals interbreed. And so sometimes you see a new that you just can't put it into one category. And the reason is because it has genetics from both the California new and the Ruskin new. Um, part of the training that we give to the volunteers is making sure that they wear a yellow reflective vest or jacket. We provide those. Um, they have to provide their own clothing. We provide a very strong flashlight. Um, we provide buckets, paint scrapers. They bring their own smartphones uh, that have to have their locators on so they can use the GPS. And everyone uses a penny uh, so that they can tell the size of the creature that they photograph. We try and start every night uh, gathering everybody together and, and letting them know what has happened you know, recently uh, because that will inform what might happen tonight. Uh, the other thing that we do is we go over the safety procedures. We repeat them all the time because it's it's very important uh, for our volunteers, for the newts, and for the neighbors that we all behave in a safe manner on the road. Here we are out on the road. It's it's still light on the left, um, and here's a newt already. You can see that most people here are in pairs. We try to not have anybody by themselves. And then it's getting a little darker. We're heading out from the cars. We try to all park way off the road and together. And here is Rich Doublefield photographing a newt. He's put his flashlight in his white bucket to give just the right amount of light to his view. Okay, now I have a series of slides here that um, show uh, underpasses. This is, this is a rather large looking underpass. You wouldn't build something like this for a newt. But the important thing about this slide is to, is to show that if you do have barriers to crossing the road that want that you want to work with newts, you have to curve the end of the barrier so that a newt going to the right would go along the edge of that uh, curb and then be right, directed right back the way it came and it would keep going and go under the underpass. So the, the message here is the way that you construct your crossings and your barriers is very important. This slide uh, indicates that uh, you need light coming in through the top of your culvert and it needs to have a flat bottom. This is a structure that is built up over the road. So uh, the road is built up before and after the structure. It's kind of like a bridge. Um, it has a little fence on it that's more for the cars and the people than it is for the for the newts and the toads. In this case, I think this is for a to for toads. And then the fencing is curved and gradual, leading to this very wide, very open crossing. So there are different ideas about how you get newts safely off the road without having to pick them up and carry them. Here is a built solution for toads up in the Forest Service area up in the Sierras. Uh, it's all built of wood. And as you can see, it uh, uh, requires cars to drive over it. So the animals are on the road. They're on the same surface that they were on before. Nothing has changed about the surface. And they're, they're quite comfortable crossing under this particular bridge. Here's another um, form. Um, the reason I put this one in here is because I think it's interesting how closely together the uh, culverts are placed and how flat their bottoms are. So again, the distance that each underpass or culvert is from 
any other underpass or culvert is important. Um, you know, whether there is light coming in from the top is important. How flat the bottom is, is important. There are all kinds of things that uh, scientists have figured out that um, ensure that newts will use what you, uh, what you build for them. There are stories of underpasses built 20, 40 years ago, which resulted in the extirpation of the populations because the animals just gave up and did not cross under the road and could not cross over the road because there were barriers put up. So it's very important to do the right research and build the right kind of crossing so that the animals can cross safely. We are a happy bunch. We are hopeful that we can raise enough funding to build uh, the proper underpasses or overpasses. But until we have that kind of money and until we can be partners with the county and the neighbors to come up with a, a suitable, uh, cost-effective and yet adequate solution, we will be out there on the road picking up the newts and having fun doing it. And this is the little guy we work for. Um, Anyone is welcome to join the Newt Brigade as long as they're high school age or above out on the road. And anyone can go to our website and donate to our uh, funding pool for a feasibility study. And that is our next step. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I um, will take questions if there are any. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Sally. If you can stop sharing your screen, we can jump into the Q&A. Well, I'm having trouble with this again. Okay, nope, there we go. Okay, we're good. Well, thank you all. Before um, we jump into the question and answer with Sally, um, I do want to let you know to please keep engaged with the Sonoma Land Trust. You can follow all of our various social media accounts or by visiting our website. You can also view this and past Language of the Land webinars on the Sonoma Land Trust YouTube channel. And you can keep an eye out for our monthly Language of the Land webinars and all of that is available on our website, sonomalandtrust.org slash outings. Sonoma Land Trust is a nonprofit organization, which means we rely on the donations from individuals, businesses, foundations to make our work possible. If you like what you heard today, please consider donating to the Land Trust. Your gift helps support land protection and preservation. To make a donation, you can go to the Sonoma Land Trust website, sonomalandtrust.org, and click the Donate button in the upper right-hand corner. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate your support for this work. Again, if you have questions for Sally, you can submit them through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will be going through those and answering only questions that have been submitted. Um, first, we're going to get started um, with the very first question here. Um, we have Sally. Let me. Uh, I'm going to spotlight you so everyone can see your face too. Hey, Mike. Sorry, my two-year-old's going to bed. Um, great. This person uh, submitted an anonymous question. It says, "I live along the creek in Santa Rosa and have newts in my yard." Do uh, Tarika newts, do California newts breed in creeks or just in ponds and lakes? Uh, yeah, they can they can breed in a creek, but um, the, the creek has to have kind of slow areas so that the eggs don't go zooming down the creek or, you know, the newts don't go zooming down the creek. So, uh, yes, if you have them in your yard, they are going to have to go someplace else to breed. Now, it kind of depends on what kind of newts they are. If they're arboreal salamanders, they don't have to go there. Mm -hmm. well, great, thank you for, for the question. I, I also, uh, just so the audience know, I have a, a little bit of research experience with Tarika newts um, and a zoology degree. So I'll, I'll jump in if I need any help, but I'm gonna let Sally answer all the questions. 
I'm not a scientist. <laughs> that's, I was excited for your talk. That's why I volunteered. Um, here's a question from Brenda from Healdsburg. She's curious about the way newts react to weather. Is it true when, uh, when rain is on the way that newts go to higher ground from the creek and when the rain subside, they head back to the creek? Do you know much about their behavior and weather? Uh -uh. Um, when it rains, when it rains in during their migratory period, so after the summer, when it starts raining in the fall, this brings the newts out of their hillside upland habitat and gets them heading heading for the lake or the creek. They're they're going downhill to a water body to to be able to breed. Um, I'm sorry, I don't see the rest of the question because you changed, you moved it. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to clean it up. It's about um, whether they, they move out of the way when large amounts of rain is coming or, or potentially flooding. Not at all. The, um, the newts like a temperature of about 55 degrees and they like a nice soft rain and that gets them out there moving. If it's a real stormy night and it's really cold, they're not interested. They're going to stay in their burrows or take, you know, get in a protected area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's actually two questions that are similar to this, which is about um, crossings and safe crossings. And you, you did um, have a couple slides showing various crossing methods. Um, so this first question is about building a bridge or a tunnel, which I think you answered in your talk. There was another question um, that was submitted about potential use of cattle guards. Have you seen newts traveling through or, or under a cattle guard to get across a road in, in safety? There is a type of crossing that looks like a cattle guard. Uh, it, it has to be, be built in a certain way, of course, because a cattle guard, a real cattle guard is just under the road and you know, trucks are able to, cars and trucks are able to pass over it, but cows and sheep cannot. So, um, but yes, there is something that looks like a cattle guard that, that makes for a great newt crossing. And I, I kind of like that design because it, it sort of fits this agricultural area. Yeah, it seems like maybe they're, they're already out there. So if we can do things to yeah. help those be more efficient with newts, then you're kind of two birds with one stone. Um, you you did talk a little bit about this. So just to give you an opportunity to clarify about time temporal, parts of, of movement. Do you see them crossing mostly at night? Do they cross during the day as well? Is it really have to do with the rain and the temperature? What have you seen? This is really a great question and one that we grapple with all the time. Um, we, we try, it, it depends on the rainfall and the temperature. So if it's a rainy night, they'll start crossing earlier. They'll cross during the daytime. So they, they might start crossing at four o'clock, say. If it's not rainy or if it rains later, you know, they'll they'll cross at night. If it's just a normal night, they're probably going to cross after sunset, sometime after sunset. If it's a warm night, they'll cross all night. If it's warm in the evening and then the temperature drops, they won't cross anymore. Then in the morning, <laughs> We have to figure out whether they're going to cross in the morning or not. They cross some mornings and not other mornings, but in general, they do not cross that much in the morning unless it's a really good, nice, dark day and with, with decent rainfall. So this is something we're always paying attention to and always trying to notice because we want to be out there when they're out there, right? Yeah, so it's almost as the more data you collect, the better your your volunteer shifts can be to maximize saving the nudes. That's right, and you have to be flexible. You have to keep changing your shifts. And um, it, I, I'm very fortunate because we have seven really good captains who keep on top of this. Mm -hmm. They keep in touch with their brigadiers. About each night has about eight to ten brigadiers. So we have these like seven teams and all of these people take a lot of responsibility to, to understand the weather and pay attention to it and keep on top of it. So I, I really wanna make the, the point, I guess, I started out talking about how 
you know, it's interesting to see what people do in response to what they perceive as a problem, an environmental problem. And I guess what I want to emphasize is that it takes a village and we wouldn't, Gail and I would be nowhere without all the help that we have from all the other volunteers. That's wonderful. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned that there's captains and the brigadiers, and um, I'll get to the question later about how do they get involved. I want to make sure we end with that. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the structure? So it sounds like there, there are captains that maybe have been there a little bit longer and they have team, like, what does that look like? Uh, so I'm the brigadier general. <laughs> you need some stars there, Sally. And then we have a lieutenant commander who's in charge of the captains. And uh, we have seven captains. And I do the recruiting and the training pretty much. And now I'm training trainers. Um, but the captains uh, manage uh, their teams and uh, make sure they're safe. They're, they're in charge of safety. Um, and then they do all the reporting for that night, which is considerable because we collect a lot of information. In addition to that, we have a steering committee of about seven really incredible people. So we're seven and seven. And the steering committee is looking at funding, you know, the bigger picture, funding, recruitment, uh, financial uh, issues. Um, you know, taxes, um, mm -hmm. uh, relation, uh, relationships with uh, the county, relationships with the local agricultural organizations, relationships with the neighbors, and and also, you know, the uh, all the mechanical things, the newsletter, and the uh, communication. One thing we don't have that might be interesting to you is we really don't have anybody doing media. And for some reason, the media media has just come to us. They have just found us. A lot of people find that quite remarkable. And I find it curious. Well, I hope someone out there in our audience is listening. I <laughs> feel so passionate. Um, it really sounds, yeah. Um, let's change subjects. What do the newts eat? What are they eating out, out there? Well, we have a picture of a newt with a worm in its mouth. So that's about all. No, they eat little things. They eat bugs and evidently they consume, um, you know, disease bearing critters um, that some disease cattle get. They eat that, they eat those. I don't really know too much about what they eat. <laughs> Invertebrates, all little things. And I think it, it might be worth bearing, uh, repeating about your, your, your role in the, the, the organization is there to protect them as they're migrating for reproduction and that where do they spend the rest of their lives when they're not crossing roads and trying to to mate in the pond where do they spend the rest of their life cycle that's when they're that's when they're up on the hills in burrows and uh it's one reason people think that they live so long is because they're very inactive during that period of their lives when they're you know when it's dry and they're hunkered down in gopher holes and under logs and under leaves and that those sort of locations. So uh, they spend a lot of their lives just kind of hanging out or hiding. Mm -hmm. um, this person has a, a question about some of your correlations and I have a, a follow up around some of the, the science and the data. Do you see a correlation with how many newts you've saved last year and the numbers of juveniles this year? You mentioned that there's been a, a real spike. Do you think there's any correlation between the work you're doing and, and reproductive success, really? I, I really can't say. You know, it, it would be nice if we could say that, but I really can't say that because there are so many other factors. Uh, you know, there's, for instance, there's development uh, that goes on, even though this is a, a relatively... Um, wild area, um, you know, there are changes to the lake that occur and changes to the upland habitat that occur. I don't know what effect those have on the populations. Um, 
So um, you said you weren't a scientist. That was the most scientist answer you could give. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. Yeah, there's a lot of factors that go in and everything from, you know, we're also in the middle of a drought that could also be having huge effects. And there's a lot of different things. You know, when, the, when it rains, how much it rains, how often it rains. I mean, all those things make a difference. And I, I don't know. I can't really look at our numbers and, and come to any conclusions. The only thing I can conclude is that, you know, we're just growing as an organization. We're doing a better and better job all the time. That's all I can do. Yeah. You, I mean, you had some pretty impressive analytics on, from your data. Is, is that all? Who, who does that? And are you working with any local ecologists or herpetologists or scientists to potentially use that data for, for larger questions? Um, we will be working with a biologist and an engineer on this feasibility study. Mm -hmm. So um, those numbers that we're collecting will be useful to them. Uh, certainly at the, at the point where some kind of underpass or overpass or something is built along that road, um, you know, the engineers will, will need to look at our data. And of course, um, and he will have to listen to the biologist and listen to her research about, you know, what works and what doesn't work. So um, right now it really it is just a citizen science project i mean we have a few people um who are brigadiers you know who are biologists or um you know who are are data data people computer people but really it's it's a pretty simple process of uh, making these observations and then just reporting the numbers every night and collecting them you can go to iNaturalist and you can see what we've done. Mm -hmm. You can look at it by location and then you can look up our group. Our group this year, you can join our group. It's um, 2022, 2023 Chileno Valley Newt Brigade winter. You can see exactly what we've come up with. Great. Um, and then have you, do you find that that, that data has been helpful for policy? I mean, you talk about, uh, you know, taking ownership of something you see that's not right in your community and, and changing it, and you, you all are doing that. Has, do you find that it's been helpful? And have you talked to like the city of Petaluma or the county who's responsible for those roads about, I mean, they're putting out signs for you, so that's great. Yeah, until they didn't, because they didn't want them stolen <laughs> this yeah. year. But yeah, we're in Marin County. We're right on the border, of course. So we're in Marin County. So the county owns the road. And uh, we have, we're lucky we have a very supportive county. Our supervisor, Dennis Rodoni, is very supportive. We're meeting with him. And then Rosemary Gaglioni, who's the chair of the Department of Pe Public Works, has been very helpful. Chris Chu, who is the senior planner for that department, has been very supportive. So um, in order, in order for us to be effective in the long term, we do need to partner with as many people as we can. We need as much support as we possibly can get with local groups, with the county, and with the neighborhood. So every, everyone needs to be behind us in, in order for us to make the proper changes on the road. Is there anything that the audience could do that might help? Um, I, you know, the audience certainly can, they certainly can donate to our, our, our fund so that we can afford a feasibility study. We know that we'll get there eventually. We just don't have enough money quite yet to pay for a feasibility study. Um, they certainly can, um, you know, write, write letters in support of the newts or in support of the newt brigade to their um, political um, representatives or uh, to send in opinion pieces to their local newspapers. Um, I think the main thing people can do is just be aware of what we are doing to um, the other animals that, that we live with. Um, when we're driving on the roads, you know, we're doing a lot of damage and 
you know, we've broken up the migratory pathways of a lot of different kinds of animals. And so any, you know, any large policy, a statewide policy, a national policy, or a local policy that that looks at the the rights or the importance of secure migratory pathways for other animals, these these can be mountain lions, they can be deer, they can be newts, they can be frogs, you know, they can be spiders. You know, a lot of different animals migrate and they have a right to maintain these pathways. They can't change. They won't change. That we're the ones that have to change. Yeah. And you know, we at the land trust we talk a lot about wildlife corridors and it's very typically megafauna centric. It's it's um, you know mountain lions and deer and elk and all these other things. But wildlife corridors, as as you and your data shows, can be all the way down to a cattle grate uh, yeah. or a, a turn on a road between the forest and the pond. Right. So I appreciate your your inclusion of the small critters as well. Yeah. What about your your processes? Have you have you looked at, at and seen like um, like are the flashlights bothersome? Are they attracted to lights, or do you find they're pretty resilient little critters? Um, I appreciate that question. We try not to, and I I know some of the pictures didn't reflect this, but uh, we try not to flash, you know, to to use these heavy uh, powerful flashlights in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Here's one of my flashlights. <laughs> it's pretty a big flashlight. Yeah, they're pretty powerful. So we we try to protect them. Yeah, good okay. question. Great. I've got some uh, pretty technical newt questions here. Uh, what's the difference between a newt and a salamander? Uh, a newt is a salamander, but a salamander is not a newt. That's pretty much it. Yeah, as a as a trained zoologist, the answer is eh, it's it's it can be a little hokey sometimes. For generally, newts have tougher, wartier, rougher, drier skin, but that's not always true. There's rough skin salamanders. Um, there's sometimes newts are more in water, but not tarika newts. They they kind of live in the terrestrial, so it's it's fuzzy, fuzzy at best. So I appreciate that you handled that question delicately. <laughs> Um, how about their, the, the reproductive cycle? Have you, you're probably noticing when they go in to breed, they become gravid, they lay their eggs. How long do the eggs take before they hatch and how long before little newts start coming back across the road? About three weeks. Very quick. And then I, I think, and although I haven't read this, but I think the newts, stay in the water until the fall because that's when I see them coming out. So they come out, they come out of the water in November and uh, the breeding period is, you know, February, March. So um, I think the little newts stay in there for a long time. Sometimes I see um, sort of teenagers coming out of the water and going up the hill at the same time as, as the little tiny babies. So I think some of them stay maybe two seasons in the yeah. water, but that's just an observation. I don't know. Yeah, some related to that. There's a question about how far they travel. Do you know? Have you found? Have you looked out into the hills and see about how far they're actually walking? It's just something that I've read, and I've read that they can they can go five miles between their breeding area and their burrows. So they're very tiny. They're very slow and they go a long ways. Yeah, I did uh, some research on Tarika newts uh, in Mendocino along the, the Rancheria Creek and we would find newts a mile plus away from the from the creek just trudging along, um, living their life out there. So those little guys can go very long ways. I know, they're so interesting. And the same with the pond turtle. You mentioned that you you know they had the pond turtle. Most people think, oh, they're just going to live in the pond. They actually, especially when they're going to go find a place to breed, can go very far away from the water in order to to find a nest. Huh. I didn't know they went a long ways. Mm -hmm. Especially to to nest. Um, uh, my own 
personal question here. Have you noticed any um, disease like chytrid fungus that often kills a lot of frogs? The, the prevailing wisdom is that chytrid doesn't infect salamanders and newts as much. Um, I've done a little bit of research that would say that might not be 100% true, but I'm wondering if you've seen any disease outbreaks. That would be that would be great if if, if it doesn't. Uh, we have not seen any indication of disease. We are concerned that um, that we will negatively affect the newts when we pick them up. So we have a whole protocol that I should have mentioned where we, you know, we make sure we have clean hands. We don't have any cream on our hands or soap yeah. on our hands. Um, and we're more we're more concerned. I'm more concerned about. Harm, harming the newts, yeah. do no harm is kind of the first thing. Then I am about the newts, the newts, you know, harming me. So um, we 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 also are concerned that if we handle one newt and then handle another newt, that you know we might, you know, uh, carry disease from one newt to another. And so in between touching the newts, what I do is I just wipe my hands off on the grass. Yeah, and dry them. It, that's that's probably that's a really good protocol, and I appreciate that. Um, and I, I think you're right. We're going to harm the newts before they harm us. Like I'm, I'm on Camp Sally about. I don't use gloves. I've handled thousands of newts. Um, don't eat them. Don't lick them. But other than that, you're usually fine. But for those that are out there, if you if you encounter a newt on the road that you think is in danger, um, I think Sally's protocols are best. You make sure you don't have sunscreens on your hand, lotions. That type of thing and you can very delicately move them off and wash your hands um have you looked at the effect of humidity on movement I, you sound like you know a lot about temperature yeah, humidity seems to make a difference barometric pressure when it drops seems to make a difference and you, you see them come out when the when the pressure drops they're expecting rain then they're start marching yeah. that's wonderful um, what is the best hope for getting a new crossing at Chileno Valley Road? Which agencies, jurisdictions must be involved? Oh, that person must have, I was reading their mind. How do we help you? How do we get these newts protected, Sally? Uh, which agencies and jurisdictions? Well, um, a funding source would be the most important thing, honestly. And that could be, um, you know, a federal or state agency, Fish and Wildlife comes to mind. Um, Coastal Conservancy, maybe. I mean, you'd have to write a grant to get money from them. Uh, private donations um, would help. I think the county is very interested in doing the right thing. I, I know they're concerned about the cost of changing that road and really altering that road. But if we could throw, honestly, if we could throw a lot of money at them, um, you know, I think they would be more than, more than grateful. Um, there, there, there is some encouragement from the state. There was uh, a bill that was recently passed for wildlife crossings. And, uh, unfortunately for us, it doesn't apply to county roads. It applies only to state roads, oh. but. There does seem to be um, an, a heightened appreciation for the, the need to provide migratory pathways for, um, for animals. So I think, I think that's, a pos that's a positive thing. The best hope is just for people to, for people to care about this and, and to, to push for it. If, I really believe if, if people ask their representatives for this this kind of assist, you know, for safer roads that 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 we will we will get them, you know, that the tide will turn. I think you just have to keep uh, keep on growing, you know. The wave has to get bigger and bigger and bigger until it it overcomes all obstacles. So the biggest the biggest thing is what's in people's hearts and what effort people will make in uh, making these kinds of solutions come about. Mm -hmm. Similar to the question about, you know, how can we get that crossing? There's another question about 
other ways of deterring new casualties. So uh, have you looked at other methods like lighting or different traffic control or what are some of those other things and have you seen them not work or is it a multi-prong approach um lighting is impossible because we're out in a rural area and it just is never going to happen and no one would want it to happen and it's not good for the wildlife anyway i don't think yeah uh the best thing that you could do is close the road this would be very unpopular, but if the road were closed during certain hours, like from um, from sundown, say until 930, mm -hmm. um, it would save a lot of critters. So that is the simplest, cheapest um, fix, but it's politic it's it's probably it probably would be very unpopular politically. Well, so here's a here's the question, and feel free to say that's too loaded. And I want to pass. How responsive have the ranchers been? You, you're talking about there's a lot of you know big changes, shutting down artery roads could be really problematic, especially during rain. Um, I mean, it's a it's a political world we live in. How's that been for your project? Um, in general, I would say that most of the people who drive by. And most of the people who live in the area are very supportive. They stop, um, they encourage us, they thank us. Um, it's nice to have that kind of interaction with the neighbors. However, the landowners that live around the lake and who own the hillside are not, at this point in time, they are not particularly supportive. Okay. Um, we have some additions to Neil's lack of clarity on newt versus salamander. Newts are toxic, last costal grooves, um, morphological terminology. Um, we answered that one. Uh, are there other threats to the newts in this area? So you're, you've talked primarily about cars, correct, is the primary concern. Um, the cars are threats along the road. Um, the, the lake, if the lake is drained, that's certainly a threat, mm. it's certainly a threat to the turtles. It was drained two years ago during a big drought year. So, um, and then it was planted. That's a threat because if there's anything hiding down into the caked mud at the bottom of the lake, um, any little critters that can get down in there and, and survive. Yeah. If you blow it up, you know, you're gonna they're gonna be mince meat, so that would be a threat. Um there, there is some development up in the hillside. I mean, you saw a picture of the hillside, it looks pretty good. So there's there's a lot of good habitat up there, but there is there is some activity up there. So there there are other threats besides the cars. Yeah. Um, here's another threat that someone mentioned. Are you concerned about highlighting an area and attracting the wrong type of folk who might be looking for collecting wildlife for personal uses? Um, and that they point out a lot of local herpetology groups are very cautious about their their sources, their places. Uh, have you seen much of that, or are newts pretty ubiquitous everywhere? That it... I have not seen any of that, uh, and I have not met anybody that that is that kind of a person. However, um, I do understand that when there is a threatened or endangered critter that is found and photographed, that if the public is interested in finding out the location of that animal, they cannot do it. And, and that is to keep collectors away. Yeah, and are you referring to iNaturalist? Yeah. yeah, so for the audience, uh, the, the database they upload it to knows what species it is because it identifies it. And if it's listed as a threatened or endangered species, it actually fudges the geolocation of it um, and moves it around. So there's a classic example of this in Golden Gate Park, there are several endangered trees like a Don Redwood tree. Um, and it actually puts the tree out in the ocean when you look at the map, because um, it, it just fudges it by about half a mile. Um, it knows where it is, but it doesn't let people see, so they can't go and harm the tree or collect the newts. And so uh, 
Trica Terosa, the um, California newt, is not currently listed, correct? It's not currently listed, but recently the IUCN lowered its uh, status from a species of least concern to a uh, near threatened status. Mm -hmm. So recently, it, internationally, it, it has dropped. But um, in some places in California, some populations are a species of special concern and some are extirpated. Some yeah. are gone in some places in California. And then the, uh, the rough skin new is as well i think it's not quite listed but it's um i think it's similar is the and then is uh rivularis is the the red belly newt which is in the north part of the county i think it's it's in danger or it's not endangered but i think it's listed as threatened um um got that one got that one well i think well there's a question about the moon phases have you seen any correlation between the moon I haven't noticed. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> yeah, maybe one of your your data hounds can start pull up some some moon setting uh, lunar phases and correlate see what they correlate. That's really super interesting. Yeah, it should be easy to get the data too. Well, yeah. I'm left with a bunch of questions that are: How do we get involved? Can you spell it out for everyone how they can get involved in the new brigade? If you're interested in getting involved, you can reach me very easily through our website. The website, just look up Delano Valley Newt Brigade, and there'll be a way for you to contact us there. You can also sign up to volunteer off of the website. Um, let's see, the other question is, when is the next time you will meet? I, I would answer that one the same way, just get a hold of me. And if you're interested in volunteering, I can um, set up a training time and date for you. The next training date, I train people almost every night, actually. Wow. The last question was about um, Battery, Townsley, and Golden Gate Park. There's That's a gun battery. Bad question. I I have heard of newts that fall into things yeah. and get stuck. Um, I've never had any experience with that, but swimming pools and it's terrible. Yeah. And in general, I would say that any water body needs a way for something that falls into it to get out, whether it's a bird in a water trough, a cattle trough, or a newt in a you know, sunken gun battery well, they need to have a way to get out. Yeah, I agree. And if you have a, a pond or a well or something on your property that you've noticed newts falling and can't get out, you can put a board or something for that to help them remove themselves. Well, our last question is a comment. It says, great presentation and questions. Thank you, Sally, for your time tonight and for, for joining us and sharing about the Chileno Valley Newt Brigade and all the work you're doing to protect our our newt friends. Um, thank you for coming. I'd like to thank Maria, our interpreter, for interpreting this presentation in Spanish. For everyone that's still here, this presentation is being recorded. It will be uploaded onto the uh, Soma Land Trust website. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Please stay in contact and have a great night. Thank you.